homage to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. In today's Dhamma session, we're looking at the Sota Anugata Sutta, and this is Ankutta Nikaya Chapter 4, Discourse Number 191. In this sutta, we're looking at the benefits or advantages of thoroughly learning the Dhamma. The Pali word that's used is Pariya Punati. So Pariya Punati means to learn by heart, to master, to gain mastership over, to learn thoroughly. And I think to learn thoroughly or thoroughly learn is something that is useful to use here, to apply here, because it means that we are studying, we are learning, we are applying the Buddha's learning system. And I think when you read this sutta, it looks at the benefit of being thorough in one's learning in this life in order to reap some benefits in the future. In discussing this sutta, we get to reference and link back to the Buddha's learning system that we've talked about before, and also the ninefold division of the Buddha's teaching to remind ourselves that it's not just the discourses, there are other parts of the Buddha's teaching that he encourages us to learn. And what we also find from this sutta is that learning is an integral part of our development. It's not simply meditating and stilling the mind. Learning it plays a huge part in order to be able to know what to meditate on, uh, the different aspects of development, and also the aspect of being able to remember, being able to discuss, and then as a result of contemplating in one's mind, being able to penetrate that Dhamma. So all of this, all of this thorough learning is the foundation from which we practice and without it it becomes very difficult to develop the right kind of practice and so ultimately what the buddha is saying with this is if you don't pursue or aren't able to pursue path and fruit in this lifetime if you dedicate to thorough learning then what happens is at a later time you're able to reach distinction so ultimately it helps us towards progressing on the path and so this is really encouragement towards understanding what it means to learn the Dhamma and also to see that there are benefits of being thorough in one's learning. And this will be a prelude to our study of the Dhamma Vihari Sutta. So that's what we're going to look at after this particular sutta, the Dhamma Vihari Sutta, which is Anguttrikaya chapter 5, discourse number 73 and 74. So let's begin. The sutta begins with the Buddha saying, Bhikkhus, when one has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited verbally and practiced them, examined them carefully with the mind, and penetrated them well by view, right view, four benefits are to be expected. So what we can see here is that there are four things that the Buddha is talking about in terms of thoroughly learning the Dhamma. The first is following the Dhamma on hearing, Sota Anugatana Dhammana. This essentially means you learn by hearing, by following with the ear, by acquiring on hearing. The second is Vachasa Parichitana. So you recite verbally or you speak about the Dhamma and you practice or gather, familiarize yourself with the Dhamma. The third is Manasa Anupekitana which means you examine it carefully with your mind. You contemplate the Dhamma, mentally investigate it. And then the fourth is Vidya Supati Vidhanam. You penetrate them well by view and certainly right view. So that means you thoroughly have understood, at least theoretically in your mind and corrected the view. So this is very similar to what we've learned by looking at Bahusutta, the Buddha's learning system that we spoke about. If we refresh our minds about the Buddha's learning system and we go back to the Sekapatipada Sutta and the Nagaropama Sutta, where the Buddha talks about one of the good qualities being one of much learning or great learning, Bahu Sutta. What the Buddha says in both those suttas is one who has heard much, has remembered what one has heard, has accumulated what one has heard. Whatever teachings are good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, that in their meaning and expression, so the phrases, the consonants, the syllables, proclaim the spiritual life that is entirely complete and pure. Those one has listened to a great deal, retained, discussed, accumulated, examined with one's mind, and well penetrated in terms of one's view. So we can see here that it's a very complete learning system. 
And this is something that the Buddha is reminding us in this Sota Anugata Sutta. You can see here that uh, Sutta, in terms of listening, uh, hearing the Dhamma, is very much at the front of the learning system. And then when you get to retaining it in your mind, memorizing, you come to Vajrasa, Parichitta, Manasa, Anupekita, Ditya, Supativitta, the last four. This is very important to thoroughly learning the Dhamma. And it just doesn't mean studying, it means being able to discuss it, being able to express it, being able to familiarize yourself with it and practice it, but then also to be able to contemplate, investigate it in your mind, carefully deliberate it, and then penetrate it. So correcting one's view is, is quite integral to this. So this is where the Buddha is coming from in terms of the foundation for this particular sutta. The first benefit that the Buddha speaks about in this Sota Anugatta Sutta is here a bhikkhu thoroughly learns the Dhamma. So the discourses, mixed prose and verse, explanations, verses, inspired utterances, quotations, rebirth stories, amazing stories and questions and answers. He has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited verbally and practiced them, examined them carefully with the mind and penetrated them well by right view. He passes away muddled in mind and is reborn into a certain group of devas. There, the happy ones recite passages of the Dhamma to him. The arising of his memory is sluggish, but then that being quickly reaches distinction. This is the first benefit to be expected when one has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited verbally and practiced them, examined them carefully with the mind, and penetrated them well by right view. If we practice really well, if we thoroughly learn in this lifetime, what the Buddha is saying is, even if we pass away muddle-minded, which is the fear of most of us that we've practiced by learning the Dhamma, hearing it and talking about it, familiarizing ourselves with it, by being able to examine and contemplate and then correcting our view. What we fear is if we are muddle-minded, then we fear that we may not ascend upwards. But say we do ascend upwards, the Buddha is saying, if when the devas recite passages of the Dhamma, as they are prone to do in some of these deva realms, then our memory that is sluggish starts to sharpen and quite quickly we can reach distinction because of the practice, the foundation that we've laid down right now. So the benefit of thoroughly learning right now, remembering the Buddha's words, contemplating the Buddha's words, hearing as much of the Buddha's words as possible, and being able to correct our view, the better it is in the future. So this is the first benefit that the Buddha talks about. What's also key is the ninefold division of the Buddha's teaching, Navanga Buddha Sasana. So the Buddha has said the discourses, the mixed prose, the explanation, the verses in poetic form, inspired utterances, the quotes, the birth stories, the amazing stories and the Q&A or subtle analysis. These are the things that we draw upon. So if one's practice is solely just on discourses, so just the suttas, then we are missing out. So that's why when we look at sutta meditation, we look at all of it. We look at the questions of King Melinda. We look at the Itivuttaka in terms of quotes of the Buddha. We look at the Udana in terms of the inspired utterances. We go back to the Jataka stories in order to understand certain dhammas. We listen to certain amazing stories from the Dhammapada things like that. There's so many different aspects when you look at the ninefold division of the Buddha's teachings that we must access because in that way we get the complete picture. We draw on the things that are there for us to learn from. Particularly you see the repetition. So you confirm from the repetition through the different parts of the Buddha's teaching, this division of the Buddha's teaching, to know that yes, this is what the Buddha has taught. So quite often when you go to the suttas, you see it repeated in the Tivutaka or you see it repeated in the Udana, or you get it clarified in, in questions that are being asked, or there are certain Dhammapada verses which imply certain things. You can see what the Buddha says and how that particular scenario or story lends itself to us understanding the Dhamma better. Same with birth stories, that in past lives as the Bodhisattva, you see certain things that are very helpful to connect with the Dhamma. So we must draw on that. So this is something that the Buddha is reminding us. 
With reference to the first benefit of thoroughly learning the Dhamma, we might say to ourselves, do they really recite passages of the Dhamma in the Deva realms? And so if we go to the teachings of the Buddha, we see as one example in the Acharya Sutta. This is Anguttara Nikaya, chapter 11, discourse number 24. And it's about Sakka uh, instructing the Tavatinsa Devas, and he does a recitation of a passage. So it says, once in the past, Bhikkhu Saka, Lord of the Devas, instructing the Tavatinsa Devas in the Sudhamma Assembly Hall, which is the assembly hall where they all gather to listen to Dhamma, on that occasion he recited this verse. Bring anger under your control. Do not let your friendships decay. Do not blame one who is blameless. Do not utter divisive speech. Like a mountain avalanche, anger crushes evil people. So this is one example of reciting passages of the Dhamma. And there are many other ones because you see when they gather in the Sudhamma assembly hall, the discourses where it talks about it, you see teachings being given, recitation of what the Buddha has said, explanations of what the Buddha has said. So if you are in the company of the devas in this particular scenario, then it's almost like it sparks something in you to make the mind that is sluggish brighten because that's the blessing of the Buddha's teaching, the blessing of his words. We then come to the second benefit of thoroughly learning the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, again, a bhikkhu thoroughly learns the Dhamma. And he goes through the same ninefold division of the Dhamma. He has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited them verbally, examined them with the mind, and penetrated them well by view. He passes away muddled in mind and is reborn into a certain group of devas. There the happy ones do not recite passages of the Dhamma to him, but a bhikkhu with psychic potency, who has attained mastery of mind, teaches the Dhamma to an assembly of devas. It occurs to him, this is the Dhamma and discipline in which I formerly lived the spiritual life. The arising of his memory is sluggish, but then that being quickly reaches distinction. And then the Buddha gives this simile. Suppose a man were skilled in the sound of a kettle drum. While traveling along a highway, he might hear the sound of a kettle drum and would not be at all perplexed or uncertain about the sound. Rather, he would conclude that is the sound of a kettle drum. And so too, a bhikkhu thoroughly learns the Dhamma and he says exactly the same thing. And then he says, this is the second benefit to be expected when one has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited verbally and practiced them, examined them carefully with the mind and penetrated them well by right view. So when we use the same simile that the Buddha gives us, it's like hearing something that we've heard before and we're very certain that we've heard it before, just like the kettle drum. So when a bhikkhu with a mastery of the mind, psychic powers, comes and teaches the devas, as we've seen in the suttas, then that's what happens. You connect and you think, I have practiced this before. Formerly, I have had this spiritual life and that this is the same Dhamma and discipline. And so when that happens, it sparks again. And the foundation that you've laid in this life, when you're reborn into the deva realm and that that happens, you quickly brighten the mind and you quickly progress to distinction is what the Buddha is saying. So it's a very good investment, this thoroughly learning the Dhamma. There are accounts in the suttas where the Buddha and the noble arahants visit the deva realms to teach the Dhamma. The one that we hear the most, other than the Buddha, is Venerable Mahamogalana. And of course, that is the case because he is the foremost at psychic powers. So an example of this is the Patamadeva Charika Sutta. This is Sangyutta Nikaya, Chapter 55, Discourse Number 18. And it says, At Savati, then, just as quickly as a strong man might extend his drawn-in arm or draw in his extended arm, the Venerable Mahamogalana disappeared from Jeta's grove and reappeared among the Tavatinsa Devas. Then a number of Devatas belonging to the Tavatinsa host approached the Venerable Mahamogalana, paid homage to him and stood to one side. The Venerable Mahamogalana then said to those Devatas, it is good friends to possess confirmed confidence in the Buddha, then he describes it. And then he says, because of possessing confirmed confidence in the Buddha, some beings here with the breakup of the body after death are reborn in a good destination, in a heavenly realm. Then he says the same thing for confirmed confidence in the Dhamma, confirmed confidence in the Sangha, 
and to possess virtues dear to the noble ones leading to concentration. Again, if you possess those virtues dear to the noble ones, some beings here with the breakup of the body after death are reborn in a good destination in the heavenly realm. And so it's confirmed, it is good, sir, Morgulana, to possess those qualities. So they agree with him. So this is an occasion where you see that there is a bhikkhu with psychic potency, has the ability to visit the deva realms to teach the Dhamma. And so on this occasion, if you are listening, then it can create that spark for the mind to become unmuddled and for distinction to come and progress to be made on the spiritual path, even in the deva realms. Then we come to the third benefit of thoroughly learning the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, again, a bhikkhu thoroughly learns the Dhamma. He lists out the ninefold division of the Dhamma. He has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited them verbally, examined them with the mind, and penetrated them well by view. He passes away muddled in mind and is reborn into a certain group of devas. There the happy ones do not recite passages of the Dhamma to him, nor does a bhikkhu with psychic potency who has attained mastery of mind teach the Dhamma to an assembly of devas. However, a young deva teaches the Dhamma to an assembly of devas. It occurs to him, this is the Dhamma and discipline in which I formerly lived the spiritual life. The arising of his memory is sluggish, but then that being quickly reaches distinction. Suppose a man were skilled in the sound of a conch. While travelling along a highway, he might hear the sound of a conch, and he would not be at all perplexed or uncertain about the sound. Rather, he would conclude, that is the sound of a conch. And again he explains, so too a bhikkhu thoroughly learns the Dhamma and it sparks again. The memory that was sluggish then quickly sparks to remember, to recall and then to practice to reach distinction. So the Buddha says this is the third benefit to be expected when one has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited verbally and practiced them, examined them carefully with the mind and penetrated them well by right view. So again, we see a very similar thing. Something sparks that memory. And in this case, it's a young deva teaching the Dhamma to an assembly of devas. In the suttas, there are a number of occasions where you hear about a young deva teaching. So one example that we've mentioned before when we looked at Hathaka of Alavi as a role model is actually the young deva Hathaka. So he was reborn into the Aviha and what he says to the Buddha when he comes to pay respects to the Buddha is the Buddha says to him, Hathaka, I wonder whether you still rehearse now the teachings that you rehearsed when you were a human being. And Hathaka replies, I still rehearse now the teachings that I rehearsed as a human being. And I also rehearse teachings that I didn't rehearse as a human being. And then he says, just as the Buddha these days lives crowded by monks, nuns, laymen and laywomen, by rulers and their ministers and teachers of other paths and their disciples. So I live crowded by the devas. The devas come from far away thinking, we'll hear the teaching in the presence of Hathaka. So this is clearly an example where Hathaka, as we know, was quite exceptional as a lay practitioner. He passed away having realized path and fruit of non-return. And so he was reborn into the pure abodes, into the Aviha realm. And as we see from his account, he now teaches the Dhamma to other devas. They come from far away to actually hear that. So it's another example where if you are in the audience, if you are one of those devas coming to listen to the Dhamma from a young deva such as Hathaka, there is the opportunity that you would recall just like the sound of a conch. Ah, this is the Dhamma and discipline that I have practiced before in my previous life where I was training, memorizing the teachings, contemplating them, it sparks something in you so that in the deva realms you can continue to practice. You are in the right company to do so. We also have other accounts in the suttas where Brahmas are teaching the Dhamma in the deva realms. One example is in the Janava Sabha Sutta this is in the Longer Discourses, so Diginikaya, Discourse number 18. And here we have Brahma Sanan Kumara. So he has manifested in a solid corporeal form, taking on the appearance of a youth, Panchasika, 
and appeared to the Tabatinsa Devas. Rising into the air, he sits cross-legged in the sky like a strong man might sit cross-legged on a well-appointed couch or on the ground level. Seeing the joy of those Devas, Brahma Sanan Kumara celebrated with these verses. The Devas rejoice, the Tavatinsa with their Lord, revering the realized one and the natural excellence of the teaching and seeing the new Devas so beautiful and glorious who have come here after leading the spiritual life under the Buddha. They outshine the others in beauty, glory and lifespan. Here are the distinguished disciples of he whose wisdom is vast. Seeing this, they delight, the Tavatinsa with their Lord, revering the realized one and the natural excellence of the teaching. That is the topic on which the Brahma Sanan Kumara spoke. And so in this particular longer discourse, it goes on to say that he teaches or preaches the Dhamma on different topics. And the Tavatinsa Devas are listening and heeding his teachings and delighting in them. And then we come to the fourth and final benefit of thoroughly learning the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, again, a bhikkhu thoroughly learns the Dhamma, and he outlines the ninefold division of the Dhamma. He has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited them verbally, examined them with the mind, and penetrated them well by view. He passes away muddled in mind, and is reborn into a certain group of devas. There, the happy ones do not recite passages of the Dhamma to him, nor does a bhikkhu with psychic potency, who has attained mastery of the mind, teach the Dhamma to an assembly of devas nor does a young deva teach the Dhamma to an assembly of devas. However, one being who has been spontaneously reborn reminds another who has also been spontaneously reborn. Do you remember, dear sir, do you remember where we formerly lived the spiritual life? The other says, I remember, dear sir, I remember. The arising of his memory is sluggish, but then that being quickly reaches distinction. And the Buddha gives this example or simile. Suppose there were two friends who had played together in the mud. By chance they would meet one another later in life. Then one friend would say to the other, Do you remember this friend? Do you remember that friend? And the other would say, I remember friend, I remember. So too, a bhikkhu thoroughly learns the Dhamma, and so on and so forth. And then at the end, the Buddha says, this is the fourth benefit to be expected when one has followed the Dhamma on hearing, recited verbally and practiced them, examined them carefully with the mind and penetrated them well by right view. As we know, when you are reborn into the heavenly realms, it is a spontaneous rebirth. So this could be that you are spontaneously reborn and another friend is spontaneously reborn. And that friend says to you, do you remember? And do you remember what we formerly did, how we led the spiritual life and trained? And at that point, you remember, you recall, and from that, that sparks something in you. And so this is the fourth benefit of thoroughly learning the Dhamma, that it doesn't take that much. It's just one spark from another being, from another deva, from a bhikkhu that has the psychic powers, or, or from hearing the recitation of the Dhamma. So when you look at these four different benefits, there is much to be invested wisely in terms of thoroughly learning the Dhamma. It gives you that strong foundation that you've laid the groundwork for future sparking, for future progress to be made. And often we worry in terms of at the point of death that what happens if one you know, dies muddle-minded? And this is the instance where the Buddha actually says that one does die muddled in mind. But if you've done the correct thing, if one has virtue, if one has generosity, if one has certain good qualities and has led a wholesome life, one that is skillful, then despite passing away muddled in mind, one ascends upwards. And so when you ascend upwards, all is not lost is what the Buddha is saying. Everything that you did in this lifetime that maybe you weren't able to penetrate further or as much as one would like, but at least that foundation is there. And so it's a worthwhile investment. You often see the Buddha counseling that even one word of Dhamma is priceless than thousands of senseless words. You see that in the Dhammapada where he has those verses on that. And the same thing is applicable here that whatever we do towards this learning process, and as we know, it's not just studying the Dhamma, it is also discussing it, turning it in our minds, contemplating it, and being able to try to penetrate it, correcting our view. 
So it's a very worthwhile thing. And so if one ascends upwards, there is the ability to untangle the mind quite quickly and to recall one's previous practice and then to practice towards distinction. One of the aspects about this practice is about what leads to progress and what leads to decline. And there was one occasion where Venerable Sariputta was giving a, a teaching and he was talking about what leads to decline and what leads to non-decline. This was in the Nalakapana Sutta, Anguttanikaya chapter 10, discourse number 68. It's the second of those suttas. So the Buddha was listening to all of this and he endorsed exactly what Venerable Sariputta said. So Venerable Sariputta says, friends, for one who has conviction in cultivating wholesome qualities, who has a sense of moral shame, who has a fear of wrongdoing, who has energy, who has wisdom, who lends an ear, who retains the Dhamma in mind, who examines their meaning, who practices in accordance with the Dhamma, who is vigilant, cultivating wholesome qualities, whether night or day comes, only growth and not deterioration in wholesome qualities is to be expected. And then he uses this example or simile. Just as during the bright fortnight, whether night or day comes, the moon only increases in beauty, roundness and brightness, in diameter and circumference, so too, for one who has conviction in cultivating wholesome qualities, who has a sense of moral shame, who has a fear of wrongdoing, who has energy, who has wisdom, who lends an ear, who retains the Dhamma in mind, who examines the meaning, who practices in accordance with the Dhamma, who is vigilant cultivating wholesome qualities, whether night or day comes, only growth and not deterioration in wholesome qualities is to be expected. And then, of course, the Buddha endorses, saying, good, good, Sariputta, and actually repeats the entire discourse of what Venerable Sariputta had said. So what's interesting about this list of what leads to non-decline is about the learning process. So of course the seika powers are first and foremost there, but also it's lending an ear. So it's about hearing the Dhamma, then retaining the Dhamma, examining their meaning, and then practicing in accordance with the Dhamma. So the learning process is a very core part of not declining, of making progress. And when you do so, it is for our good. So it's good in this lifetime, of course, and it's also good in future lives if one has not penetrated further or finished it off. This is an encouragement from Venerable Sariputta and of course overall an encouragement from the Buddha that the way we learn is very important and not to dismiss the effort that we make in this lifetime and to prioritize some time towards making that effort now because as we can see from these four benefits it is a boon to us to be able to maximize the potential not just in this life but in future lives and many people do worry that they don't put enough into it. But if you know that this is how you put more effort into it and how it can make progress in future, it is also something that encourages you, gives you a sense of maybe I should do this. And Buddha explicitly says this is how you do it. As we know, we never lose the wealth of whatever spiritual faculties we sharpen, whatever qualities we nurture, the wholesome side of, of the practice, the merit that we make, all of that it adds up and nobody and nothing can take that away from us. So that is, that is the key and something that each one of us should contemplate and put into action. We've now come to the end of our session looking at the Sota Anugata Sutta. Let's share the merit with all sentient beings. May all beings be happy and well. May all beings be free from suffering. Blessings of the Triple Gem. Wishing you well. Teruwan Saranai.